Okay, my friends, this is a shocker du jour. Do you know that virtually everything there is to do with astrophysics, means space research, depends on space being virtually a complete vacuum? Well, it's obviously not. It is saturated with particles, as we will see. However, they don't acknowledge this. They say outer space is not completely empty. It's near perfect. No, it's not. It's 100% saturated with all of these things they're talking about. Plasma, electron and magnetic radiation, fields, neat neutrinos, dust, cosmic rays. Those are all particles. Everything has to push through them, and that slows light down. We got big problems in physics, especially with the Big Bang and all that stuff. Redshift, not a thing there is correct. Okay, my friends, this is the reason nothing will ever change, is they don't realize that space is saturated with particles. We are scrubbing through those particles, and our outer ionosphere zone is over 2,000 degrees. That's the reason it's so hot down here. It's not because the stuff can't get out. It's because it's scrubbing this zone against space, which is not empty. It's saturated with particles. Just take a look at the Webb or Hubble telescope. It's saturated. Clouds of them. And they say they're having a hard time seeing through it, obviously. It's, the, the universe is completely, 100% saturated, every single square centimeter, with particles of light, and dust and all kinds of things. That is the scrub zone. They will never ever understand how to combat global warming or what, they, they have no clue right now, totally lost. We're on one of these arms being ripped around a galaxy called the Milky Way and everything in front of it we have to push through. And that's why as we move around there it's scrubbing these zones which are being fed by all of these particles from everywhere, but just everywhere. So this is never going to be, as she said, oh, we just have to pay attention to it. They don't even know what they're looking at. They claim there's no particles in space here. It's 100% saturated. The sun is 10,000 on the surface, a million and more out here. How did it get so hot out here? They have no clue and no explanation. Same thing with us, 100 or so on the surface, 1,500, 2,000, somewhere around here, out here. To, well, there's no, no explanation whatsoever. None. Zero. And they can't explain gravity, they can't explain anything, because they don't understand the particles. They don't understand that light is, it saturates. They do understand it, but they just won't, won't deal with it. Hold on one second. Look at this. They all know it. Empty space isn't empty. It's not empty. It's saturated with a dizzying display of change. All of these little particles, subatomic particles, that's electrons, neutrons, protons, whatever you want to call them. They're atomic particles. They're not big balls of matter, but there is some of those out there, a lot of them, planets and stars and all that. But everywhere else is these subatomic particles. Empty space isn't empty. We have to scrub through it. Quantum foam is real. The microcosm is in continual motion. They understand it, and that means that the Hubble Space Telescope, the distances, the redshift, the Big Bang, all toned into, totally needs to be rethought. See here? They have no, no explanation for this. The cause of the coronal temperature inversion, that means the corona, corona of the sun, which is the big outside edge, is extremely hot, and the surface is, is much, much, much cooler. And they say, and they're talking about the solar wind, which is all the particles that we flow through. As I showed you, this is all the particles that are coming off the sun. I mean, it's, look at that. That's all the particles that are just going out into space. We have to scrub through them because the sun is ahead of us, and we're coming behind it and smashing into all its debris. And these are the impact zones here. That's why they're so bright in these two, three spots. The sun is spinning this way, moving that way. This is the slough side. We're going to go through all this in so much detail, you'll, you'll probably not want to go through it. But if you don't go through the details, the big picture is fine. The details are much more important. Okay, my friends, this is really what it's all about. It's called ignition. 
we can absorb a certain amount of energy and then at a certain point, just like a piece of paper, it pops into flames. This is what happens with an atomic bomb blast. The first thing that hits this house is the white brilliance of the blast. You're going to see everything in the air combust. This is in slow motion. See everything? Now the house is just burning because the white particles are burning it up. And I will show you where these white particles come from in our atmosphere. Now watch what happens. Boom. There goes the house because those are the black particles. Now everything turns around and comes back. This is exactly what's going to happen to the earth. All right, if you've been following me, you know that I have found virtually all the things that were written in the ancient texts need a minimum to be looked at again. And most of them, or a lot of them, I have confirmed are actually legitimate, insanely crazy, spectacular things, but they have factual material evidence that supports them. So, to me, that's more important than it's crazy. If it's, if it's there, it's there, <laughs> and they're there. Now, I always wondered how could they tell when these things, these prophecies would occur. Well, there is a certain amount of absorption that the earth can stand, and we are not only being absorbed by going through the atmosphere, we're expanding that absorption by all the combustion that we have on the earth, way, way more than it should be, because we really are using the resources of the earth in a, a very poor manner. Now, this is what it says here in the Bible, King James Bible. And I don't, I, it, for me, ancient texts are ancient texts. I don't care what you call them. The Quran, the Bible, the Gnostics, the, they all had their own stories, and they were all similar and all had their own little variations. And that's all it is, is variations. They're, they they go back to the gods and all that stuff. So. It's time that we took a whole new look at this in light of the mud fossil evidence. It's just too overwhelming. Listen to this. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's called ignition. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Then it goes. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Now, we could combust into something. And that's what all it would do. Just like when... When Venus almost hit Earth, the same thing happened. Great noise. They said it was absolutely amazing. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. They said the oceans boiled. The Earth also and the works that are there with, therein shall be burned up. Now, this could relate to that event, possibly, because and then it started back over again, or everything's going completely. But it's going to happen again, and not too long, because we're just abusing the Earth is planting new trees miles inlet, where they're less likely to become ghost forests. With the climate literally changing around us, uh, adaptation is the key. You know, so we may not get the forest back exactly the way it was or exactly where it was, but we can keep that resource alive on the landscape. Its effects reverberate far beyond this forest. Oh, absolutely. It plays a, a much larger role in the overall surrounding ecosystems. And I think that's important for people to remember. It's not a hopeless story. These forests can be restored, they can be saved, and you can adapt. Researchers predict that over the next century, up to 18,000 square miles of dry land in the U.S., about the size of Maryland and Vermont combined, could be submerged in water. I mean, you talk about saving the forest for the trees, and it's yeah. haunting when you see the change that has happened in just one generation. Mm -hmm. But there does seem to be some hope there, Nancy, at the end, where he says yeah. this forest, these forests can be saved. We, do, we need to pay attention to that, right? Yes, exactly. And it's something that people should be aware of that's happening. A lot of folks who yes. don't live near the water yeah. don't realize these communities are being lost, but they are trying to grow new forests and also nurture the marshes these forests have become. As long as we still have solutions, we have hope to restore. There you go.